Okay, I hope that uh, you all can hear me. I have a tendency to talk pretty loudly when I'm presenting, so uh, on the, on the uh, boards back there, definitely uh, provide some attenuation if necessary. Good morning. My name is Eric Johnson. I'm a regional engineering manager with Lucent Technologies. I'm based out of Portland. It was a very exciting gray drive down for me today. I uh, was quite surprised to see as the weather turned so rapidly. Yesterday was an absolutely gorgeous day, and I did see blue peeking through this morning, but uh, say la vie. I was contacted uh, very late last week by uh, E.J. von Schomburg, who is one of our liaisons into uh, the 802.11 uh, committee, and uh, unfortunately he was not able to make the show as much as he had wanted to. So he asked, indirectly asked me to uh, come in and to present to you. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is, the, is essentially the state of wireless, and uh, I'm going to be focusing on 802.11 and some of its derivatives. This is intended to be an overview, and I'll need to, I'll need to get some feedback from you in a, in a second as to uh, uh, what kind of expertise we have in the audience, but uh, it is not intended to be an exhaustive rundown on uh, all wireless technologies. I'll touch on wireless loop, for instance. I won't be touching on wireless sonnet or uh, some of the other uh, some of the other high cap uh, systems. On a scale of one to let's say th uh, one to five, uh, can I get a show of hands as to uh, who fits in uh, with one being lowest and, and five being highest level of expertise? How many of you fall into the one to two category? Okay. How about the three to four category? And how about five? Okay, so it looks about three to four is about probably where we're at. Uh, I would, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to give you some information which will, um, uh, which may be rehashed for some of you. And uh, if it turns out that it's not what you want to hear, uh, let's make this interactive. Just give me the hand sign and I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and move, start moving forward. Uh, in addition to uh, talking about some of the uh, some of the different, uh, the, at least the current state of 802.11, I also want to, at the end of this uh, discussion, uh, to give you some indication of what some of the uh, some of the organizations that I've dealt with, or at least that my staff has dealt with, uh, what kind of applications are using wireless in. And uh, also, I'd like to talk a little bit about what, at least from my perspective, is happening out at Bell Labs. And uh, we've got some very interesting things develop, uh, developing in that area. The point I wanted to make with this slide is that, is that th there are some very real reasons why 802.11 is in the current state that it's in. And much of these are, are driven by, uh, by people such as yourselves who have made requests for certain levels of technology. What we're now seeing is a, is a maturation of 802.11 as far as, it, as far as local area networks are concerned. And now, we start, now we're starting to see some uh, development of the technology into the WAN. And uh, it's, it's, when, when you start moving into the WAN, there's going to be certain limitations in terms of how 802.11 operates. Uh, as, a, as a consequence, we're now starting to see uh, an evolution of that technology into something that's more suited for wide area network use. Uh, particularly, let's say, for instance, uh, uh, for uh, kind of a quasi-local loop system. The, uh, and that technology today is fairly proprietary. Uh, there are a number of vendors out there, uh, Lucent, Breezecom, Aeronet, that are, uh, that are uh, uh, developing these technologies. I would expect within a year or two that you'll start to see some standardization effort uh, uh, wrap up in respect to how those technologies are working. Most importantly, I think for many of the customers that I've seen, cost control is a primary consideration as to why, they, why wireless is deployed. If you look at the cost of, of, of uh, developing infrastructure, wire infrastructure can be very, very expensive. Let's say $500 to $1,000 per drop for, for wire applications. And uh, uh, many, of the, uh, many of the applications that I've seen have been derived as a result of that cost. They're looking for a significant way of reducing the cost. Additionally, there are areas where flexibility, extreme flexibility is the case. Uh, uh, we've got one customer who is, uh, who is looking at uh, deploying wireless LAN technologies on high-speed trains and uh, for to uh, telemetry and other information coming from these trains as they move by. So uh, that's something that just simply can't be uh, handled by some of the traditional uh, networking technologies. 
where we're at now, um, my talk is decidedly nonpartisan. However, uh, because of the uh, because of the nature of what I do, uh, I'm, I want to point out. I'm not trying to hide anything from you here. Uh, I want to point out that PubLand, in this case, uh, is a product set that's made by Lucent. I'm not going to be talking about PubLand as uh, as a product, but more as a technology. This is going to be some wide area network uh, uh, wireless technology. We've seen a number of, of older and slower uh, technologies deployed. CDPD received a lot of press uh, in the last uh, probably three to four years ago. And we also uh, have seen an, a great number of, um, uh, of different mechanisms surrounding the deployment of, wire, of, of wireless local loop. And, and that continues today. However, because of the advances that we've seen with 802.11 moving from uh, one and two megabits per second of, of trans sustained transmission throughput, and now with the, with the uh, draft 10 of the 802.11 spec having been ratified, I believe, in the last couple of days, and so, someone please keep me honest on this, it, the vote was in May. Now we see, uh, see transmission rates sustained between 2 and approximately 11 megabits per second. And that's where this technology comes in. And the, of key importance here is to notice that, it, that this particular technology is portable. It doesn't require uh, a fixed uh, a set of stations per se. Uh, you can deploy this technology on, on uh, as I alluded to earlier, trucks. Uh, you can deploy it on as in much the same way as it's being deployed here with some of the wireless workstations uh, here. You can roam. Uh, you can move about. And again, the same cannot necessarily be said for, for some of these technologies. CDPD, of course, uh, was a hallmark in that area for, for portability. Unfortunately, uh, in terms of speed, it was uh, fairly limited. And of course, uh, when you look at the economics too, uh, with some of the some of the wireless technologies, cost can be very very low. But then you get extreme throughput. In this case, 11 megabits per second. So, makes for a very compelling argument for deploying this technology. Here's some comparisons of the technology. I know this is a bit difficult to read, but uh, if you can look at the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, by the way, if you've not downloaded the presentation, you can get it uh, at ftp.mindspring.com slash users slash ES Johnson. Name of the file is nanog99.zip. And what we're looking at for the 802.11 and other variants uh, are, are the following characteristics. High speed and portable. Typically mobile end devices. And right now we're operating in the 2.4 gigahertz realm, which I will talk to in just a second. By the way, the, there's variability in the performance between 2 megabits and 11 meg megabits per second. There are a number of different, uh, number of different uh, uh, scenarios in which you would see lower performance, well, one being distance or, uh, or uh, uh, noise. Uh, and ideally, uh, you'll look at something toward 11 me megabits per second. I'm not aware of if anyone running at that speed, typically in about the 5 to 8 megabit per second realm max. This is license-free spectrum. And uh, currently, we're looking at a, uh, at a spectrum window of about 84 megahertz in the 2.4 gig uh, realm. Now, uh, in future versions of the standard, there is uh, a great deal of talk right now and work toward a 5.8 gigahertz standard. And uh, of course, the spectrum in that is going to be much wider. We're looking at about 125 megahertz. This is going to be great. This is really going to open up a, a number of, of other interesting applications. The 802.11 standard is currently based on direct sequence technology, where you, where you uh, over a certain spectrum, uh, you take advantage of the full spectrum uh, of, uh, of uh, free full frequency spectrum. Uh, the, some, there are some technologies that are based on frequency hopping. Uh, so they are generally proprietary in nature. And uh, interestingly enough, despite the fact that 802.11 uh, uses direct sequencing, some of the emerging technologies are now falling back to frequency hopping. Uh, frequency hopping has a, has a unique capability in, uh, in closed environments of, of selecting the best frequency to, uh, to, to use. And uh, also has some inherent, uh, I'll call it noise rejection capabilities. Uh, direct sequence uh, is typically, typically works best in wide open spaces. 
And I believe that was one of the compelling reasons to go with direct sequence uh, technology. Now this is a this is an interesting slide. This is, in some respects, this is based on some of uh, my team's experience with these different technologies. Uh, when you look at some of the uh, uh, some of the older 802.11 uh, technologies, we typically saw uh, transmission range with a standard low gain antenna uh, in the one megabit to two megabit range, and you could really extend some of these uh, some of these trials out. Uh, there is a uh, uh, we uh, we did a, uh, a trial out at the uh, city of the Dalles in eastern Oregon. And uh, the buildings that they had within the city are, uh, were built well over 100 years ago and have these very, very thick, uh, you know, three and a half foot thick sandstone walls. And, and based on red iron in the ceiling and based on, on uh, the, the, the radios and the type of antenna we were using, we were actually able to, uh, with between one and two meg, get up to about three to, uh, to 400 uh, feet away from uh, from a a single access point, single uh, central node. Now, in some of the other experiments we've done uh, out in, in southern Colorado, we've actually seen using that that same standard low gain antenna, we've actually seen dramatic increases in the in the amount of uh, in the distance between uh, nodes in uh, transmission rates. Now, typically, what will happen is if you're operating at a higher uh, at a higher speed, let's say two megabits per second. Uh, as you start to move away, as, as the signal to noise ratio uh, degrades, then you'll see, uh, you'll see the system start to ratchet back to a lower speed until ultimately uh, to, to conserve uh, or to preserve the integrity of the data, it'll, it'll simply drop off. It's kind of a cliff roll off. Uh, now, uh, theoretically, 802.11 is, is offering up to, uh, uh, 11 megabits per second, as I had uh, mentioned before. I've, to date, I've not seen any systems being able to perform up at that level, typically between the 5 and the 8 megabit per second sustained rate. <coughs> not all applications require this level of performance. Some, uh, some applications will work that well down at the uh, 1 megabit level. Again, the uh, draft 10 of the, uh, of the standard uh, has been ratified or will very, very soon be ratified. The vote w was in May. Unfortunately, I was not able to get the specific date of the vote. Uh, we're looking at one common MAC for, uh, uh, for, uh, for 802.11. The interesting thing about this is if you look at the standard, the, the phi, the phi uh, uh, description is, uh, is in some respects independent of, of radio frequency technology. In other words, it is conceivable that you could use something like infrared and, uh, and still, uh, still maintain the kind of, uh, of connectivity uh, and, and performance that, you, that you're looking for. I'm not aware of anyone operating in an infrared mode or even doing any development for that matter. But, uh, but the nice thing about the standard is it allows you to swap out five sets necessary. And of course, uh, 5.2 5 gigahertz is, uh, is not here yet. Uh, there's a lot of development effort uh, taking place in that realm. I would expect within the next 12 to 24 months to see uh, a great deal of that technology starting to be deployed. A lot of that has to do with FCC regulations, too, and opening up that, that um, particular spectrum. Uh, 802.11, it was formed as a result of a, a large consortium of industry uh, participation, and it was optimized specifically for land use. However, you're starting to see some, starting to see some uh, deployment of this technology into the WAN, and I'm going to talk uh, here in just a few minutes as to how you do that. The, tech, the, the core technology itself remains uh, unaltered, or I don't want to say unaltered, but uh, the core technology uh, remains the same in terms of transceivers, but you start to find uh, extended application with the, with the varying types of antenna that you can apply. There are, and uh, there must be at least 20 different types of antenna I've seen applied to, these, uh, to this technology. I'm going to skip over this for right now. So here are some of the typical configurations that, uh, uh, that you'll see. Uh, first and foremost is a standard uh, a wireless LAN. This really doesn't even, uh, even have, a, uh, uh, this is really not scalable, something like you would use in this room. You'd have a single access point, or actually no access point. You'd have all workstations con uh, contributing as part of a, uh, of a uh, baseline infrastructure. 
very simplistic, uh, not too scalable. Then uh, you, can, you can then uh, start applying a wire and actually uh, the, developing a, a small wire-based network, but still employ some wireless stations within this network. Uh, I don't see too much of this, but this is where we start to see uh, some of the applications. This is where uh, you'll actually have a wired net, and then you'll have one or perhaps more uh, what I'm calling access points. These are, uh, for instance, in this show, I believe it was mentioned we've got 11 uh, access points uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the, uh, the hotel. What this allows you to, to do is to essentially set up, uh, set up some nice frequency or some nice uh, coverage path, uh, regardless of where you are in the hotel. You walk around and you'll, you'll connect up to a, a point. This is typically where, where a, a great deal of businesses, uh, commercial businesses, are operating. Now, if we look at the next slide where we have multiple, what we start to see is, uh, is a very large scale deployment. Uh, a number of universities uh, that we're working with uh, are typically deploying this technology and, and, and doing so with, uh, using a variety of different antenna types. Uh, within the campus itself, you'll see uh, uh, a great number of people connecting up to any particular uh, access point, and as they roam through the campus, then they'll simply uh, uh, connect through another cell. Uh, it's uh, it, it very, very scalable. Uh, some of the universities that, that we are, are working with, we've seen uh, in, in excess of 6,000 people uh, in attached mode. Of course, another variant of this is when, uh, is when you use it essentially in riser applications performing exactly the same function. Now this is where it gets interesting. Uh, this, this is where you take the inherent LAN-oriented technology and by use of, uh, for instance, something like a Yagi or a parabolic antenna of some kind, then you can get some point-to-point some -point service. Now in this case, uh, we've had uh, a couple of universities who have driven from between five up to 30 miles using this technology, and it depends on the type of antenna that you're using. If you're using a, a, a low, actually a moderate gain antenna like a Yagi, which might be between 12 and, let's say, 16 dB a gain, uh, then you can typically go up to, uh, let's say, five or six miles. Uh, I did have one instance where we, uh, uh, where, uh, I believe it was University of Colorado, uh, where they needed to, oh, University of Denver, where they needed to uh, go an extreme distance, uh, uh, upwards of 30 miles, and by using a 24 dB gain parabolic, uh, we were able to, uh, uh, to see about 30 miles of transmission. And this is really interesting, too, because if you use those parabolics in a, uh, in a, in a much closer uh, range, uh, you, can, uh, you can tend to uh, uh, provide some, uh, some problems for, uh, for some users. Those, those parabolics are, are very hot. I mean, put a, a chicken in front of that thing, it'll cook it, despite the low output. And of course, then uh, what we can do is uh, we can take uh, some directional, uh, low gain or moderate gain directional antennas such as Yagi, and then we can, we can essentially point those back line of sight back to an omnidirectional antenna at a central site. This is where I think you're going to see most of the application. This is where ISPs come into play. This is wh uh, where, where you're serving a large campus. You'll have a single, uh, uh, a single Yagi. Uh, that's attached to, um, uh, to your customer site or to, to the campus site, and then you uh, simply go back to, the, uh, uh, back to your service provider. This is not a product, uh, 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 I'm not running into product or marketing here. Let me point out the different components here. These are typical of any, other, of any manufacturer. We've got a very low gain internal antenna here. Typically you find uh, uh, cards in the form of a PCM, say A, uh, adapter with a built-in antenna, very low gain antenna, and then you'll see you'll find uh, access points, which is essentially a wall-mounted or, or uh, uh, you know a red iron-mounted uh, device to which all of the PCs or other devices attach to. And then you see also ISA carriers now, where you can uh, this module where you can take this technology and plug it into an ISA carrier. Now. Uh, I said I was going to deviate slightly from ADA 211, and this is where the deviation comes in. We're now seeing uh, the development and deployment of technologies for wireless loop that essentially provides you with, uh, with serial uh, services. In this case, uh, the technology such as this, where you're using Yagi's or, or omnidirectional antennas, can emulate T1 or E1 
uh, and pr provides you with a variety of different outputs. This is decidedly not 802.11 right now. This is, this is proprietary technology. The fact of the matter is, is that it's coming out very quickly and you're going to see a great number of service providers uh, using it because it allows you to define the, the bandwidth that you want to use for that for a particular application. This is an example of a Yagi antenna. Yagi's are around, oh, about this big, uh, typically fairly lightweight, mass mounted, and again, you're going to see about a 14 dB gain at 2.4 uh, gigahertz. The complement to the Yagi is an omnidirectional antenna. This is typically about 7 dB gain. It's a, it looks like a light, we call them lightsabers. They're about this tall, <laughs> and not due to the movie. And, uh, and it's a fairly simple mass mounted uh, uh, unit. Combine the Yagi and the omnidirectional antenna together and uh, it forms a basis for a nice wide area LAN. And again, all depending on, on, on line of sight, weather, et cetera, et cetera, you can find some great utility between these two different types of technologies. Now, this is, uh, this is an interesting thing, too. We had a, um, at, we've uh, been doing some development with a, an organization where they are mounting this technology, which is an uh, uh, omnidirectional vehicle antenna, about six to eight inches tall, on the top of trucks. So when trucks pull into, uh, into uh, various truck stops or what have you, uh, the trucks will automatically register with the LAN and then be up and running. Uh, very interesting uh, technology. It's low gain, 8 dB, but it's a ruggedized and, and obviously weatherproof uh, device. So uh, again, much of the utility that you're going to find is based on your antenna design, not necessarily on the, on the technology. Uh, I, I had to use uh, some product uh, information here, but again, this is typical of industry. These are, the, uh, this, these are the different types of distances that you can realize with speed uh, and throughput being uh, uh, up here on the top and then uh, gain, antenna and gain over here. So obviously with, uh, with a um, 24 dB gain antenna, one of these big parabolic uh, chicken cookers, you can see upwards of 30 miles. I'm going to skip past this. Okay, 802.11 uh, 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 evolution. Uh, we see a great number of people who are interested in, in voice over IP right now. And this makes a very nice uh, natural migration into uh, into that sort of technology. Uh, also, uh, again, ISPs are, uh, are, very, uh, are very focused on, on this type of technology, especially the non-802.11, the, pro the proprietary technologies, where you can essentially structure a great number of, of uh, connections back to, in a hierarchical format, back to a service provider, and, um, and essentially use, kind of a, 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 use it, as, in essence, as, a, as an adjunct to a local loop. Also, you're going to see development. Uh, we're currently at 11 mega megabits per second at 802.11. You're going to eventually see deployment of 30 megabits per second as they really crank this technology up. Now, uh, I've got two minutes, two minutes left. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about futures. I don't know if any of you read the uh, Wired, uh, two, or th two or three months ago, the Wired article about BLAST. But um, uh, this is, uh, I want to give you some perspective into what the lab is doing. Uh, I'm sure that there are out here uh, a number of people who remember PEP. If you're old Telebit hacks, uh, PEP was a, uh, was a uh, data link protocol used by Telebit modems. And uh, essentially what it did is it, it took the entire usable frequency of, your, uh, of, the, of the telephone uh, line, 2700 hertz, and broke it up into a number of smaller uh, subcarriers and channels. And, uh, and the effective baud rate, if you will, of, of PEP was something on the order of 5 to 7 baud. However, by applying uh, symbolized information over that broad spectrum of, um, of uh, frequencies, it was able to, uh, to realize throughput of about 192K. And BLAST is essentially the same thing. Now, BLAST is interesting, ex except that it, it allows you to, uh, the potential exists for a, a very, very high degree of throughput, many, many tens of, megahertz, uh, of megabits per second. It's very high efficiency. We're looking at about 40 bits per second per hertz at normal SNRs. And then if you, if you expand it across a great number of frequencies, you can start to see uh, where, where this technology may go. This is purely experimental, purely in the lab. I've got a white paper here. If, any, if anyone is interested in digging in, uh, this will really get your propeller spinning. Uh, additionally, one of the interesting things about bl uh, BLAST is that it exploits multipath versus avoids multipath. Okay? Well, the great bane of wireless is multi is one of the great banes of wireless is multipath where you have signals bouncing off of buildings and such, it's especially prevalent within cities. 
something like BLAST, which will <coughs> what BLAST does is, uh, unlike conventional uh, transmission and receiver structures, where it's very serial, you have data coming in, goes out through a single antenna, typically over a single frequency, and then into a corresponding receiver unit, and then out as data. What something like BLAST will do is it will take that information, it'll encode it uh, in a way that can, where it can be presented to multiple frequencies over multiple transmitters over a, an antenna array, and then uh, the, the, it'll be, the information will be sent out. It's symbolized information. When it gets to the other side, regardless of what path it took, uh, the strongest signals will be, uh, will be picked up, will be decoded, and then the information is reassembled and put back at her. So it actually exploits multipath. This is very exciting stuff, and uh, without getting marketing oriented on you, it had, uh, I believe at least that it has the, the uh, it has some great potential in the future. Whether or not it becomes a commercial product, I don't know, but it's certainly something that uh, is happening within the wireless space right now. Uh, finally, I wanted to uh, to leave you with some information regarding uh, some, some uh, further reading. If you're not, uh, if, if you uh, are not tuned into Bell Labs, you have the ability to, to get updates on some of uh, uh, on a great number of white papers that they develop and publish in the in the interest of forwarding uh, science. Uh, if you go to this website, uh, this will get you to the Bell Labs Technical <coughs> Journal area, and uh, they've got some very very uh, very deep, I guess, for lack of a better description, uh, publications on uh, on the state of wireless and, and essentially what's coming two to perhaps five years down the road. Last was one of the things that was that was uh, featured in uh, in Bell Labs Technical Journal. It is free of charge, so uh, I mean, uh, go go for it. Uh, there is a special wireless issue which might be of interest to you, and uh, it's not out yet, but the July through September issue, uh, Volume Four, Number Three, will be coming out here shortly, and uh, you can download it it's in PDFs. Uh, again, it's free of charge. And that is it. That is record time. I usually go for about four hours in a stretch. Uh, I don't think I have any time for questions at this point, but I will stick around if, uh, if anyone would like to, uh, like to hit me up. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Questions? Questions? Come on, Craig. I'll go to the mic. I was... Uh, I was thinking maybe we have John go, and then we have questions in general, or is it is it really Bill? Is it wireless specific? Yeah. Um, okay. Lucent, well, Lucent no, Lucent we've got two wireless test. talks this morning. I'll, I'll be happy to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, no, we, we can answer the question now. It looks like uh, Stephen is. Did, did you want me to address the questions okay. now, or? It looks like I see. Okay, okay, two questions really quickly. One from Stephen. Wait, 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 we can't hear you. Okay, so. Wait, wait, um, you, have you have to introduce yourself first. I'm Bill Woodcock, and that's Stephen Stewart. Okay. Hi there. Um, so, you're talking about a future in which more and more things are point to multi point, and I agree entirely. It looks to me like where things are going. And so, we've done a lot of shopping around, and uh, I've only found one product that seemed to have a good layer two forwarding table scheme built into it, and that would seem to me to be the only really sensible way of solving hidden transmitter problems. Can you discuss that a little bit, if there are other things that are happening, or if everybody does that and they just don't talk about it, or what the deal there is? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I heard part of the question. Yeah, it might, might be better down here. If I understand the question correctly, you're asking about, uh, the, uh, about essentially bridging capabilities, but not necessarily at, at, a, at a We'll say an Ethernet data link layer. Is that correct? Right. You're looking at essentially establishing a hierarchical network and then and bridging between those nodes. Absolutely. Uh, again, I'm decidedly non-commercial in this. I'm non-partisan. But something something like this access point will allow you to do that, where you can actually create a relay network of uh, of, of nodes. Uh, this particular device, and, and there are a number of, of, of other industry products like this. Uh, will accept two cards. Uh, one can be a, uh, a card for local area, and then, which is essentially a, a uh, I'll call it a point to multi point. That is, a, a, this will be a central site going out to a number of different users. And then the second card can, uh, can establish a network of these devices. Now, that, that's, that's entirely bridged, it's, it's, uh, it's layer two. 
There's also uh, some proprietary technology that's coming out. And again, Breezecom and Lucent and a number of other companies are, are deploying this, which is not 802.11 right now. And, and it allows you to create a hierarchical network, uh, specifically designed for WAN applications, where you can have, let's say, up to 600 separate uh, nodes consolidating up into, let's say, 10 uh, remote site nodes, and then ultimately back into the, into the central carrier space. So you're saying that box bridges, but its number of <laughs> logical peers is limited by its number of physical interfaces? Uh, no. Well, it, yeah, it, it, this, this particular technology in and of itself, if you're using a wireless relay network, is going to be limited. Uh, it is limited by the, by the number of interfaces that you have. You'll have one of the cards that are serving a local area. The second card will be a, essentially a point-to-multipoint network, which allows you to network these devices together. But you're using one frequency. You're, you're, you're using one limited spectrum. Uh, so while it will work, it's not necessarily the best way to do it. Probably the best way to do it is to have these things uh, um, wired back into a switch or some other, uh, some other more capable device and let them simply serve the wireless application. Yeah, but, but yes, you can do that. Out. I mean, it, uh, there, there are products out there right now that build a forwarding table and choose uh, next top based on signal strength. Y yes. Which yes. is the right way to do it. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, but so the question is, is, that, is there a standard for that, or is there more than one vendor doing that? There is more than one vendor doing that. Is there a standard for that? I, to be honest with you, I don't know. I, I can certainly uh, take your name down, and what I can do is go back to the uh, uh, back to some of the folks that. Well, I've, I've got the I've got the 802.11 standard on my PC, so I can I can uh, look into there. I can also go and con better yet, I can consult some of the people that do that on a daily basis and get an, get an answer for you. So I'm my, I'm Stephen Stewart. My apologies to Craig, but I have to tell a short tale of woe before I ask my question, and additional apologies for the fact that it's operational in nature. Um, <laughs> I ran 915 megahertz in my house, um, and the distance between me and where I wanted to be wireless was about 30 feet, and life was good, and then I had a baby, and she's, she's very nice, um, <laughs> but the baby monitor would go click, 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 click every time I pressed a key at 915 megahertz, which was amusing until I started getting mail, and you know, a megabyte of data going click, 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 mm -hmm. made my wife very angry, so I switched to 2.4 gigahertz and life was good, until we started using the microwave oven. Mm. <laughs> and when I use the microwave, all traffic stops. Sure. When I move to 5.2 gigahertz, how will I be screwed this time? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. And while I, while, <laughs> while I can't specifically address uh, uh, or for that matter, predict uh, what's going to happen. Based on the information I've seen, uh, uh, when you get up to five, in the five gig range, uh, it's my understanding that there's going to be some immunity to that. Now, uh, uh, again, I would be happy to dig farther into that and, and, uh, and talk to some of the people who really know and, uh, and get some information for you. But it's my understanding that there is, that there is going to be some rejection of, uh, of uh, my microwave and my baby monitor. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. now, 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 how that affects all 2.4 gig products, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to be on a vendor by vendor, vendor by vendor basis. Certainly, uh, uh, I would expect that, uh, given the fact that, that much of this technology is based <laughs> on a on a well defined and very mature standard, that they would all operate the same way. But you know, uh, yeah, now that goes. Great. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks.